lovelies, my name is Emily and this is my channel Painful Clarity and today we're doing Churchy Talk. Uh, Bella is on my lap because she just couldn't even stand the hour that I was gone at church. So she just needs to be on me. So there was a different, um, there was like a guest pastor I guess you could say. It wasn't Pastor Dan. Um, but the church is so blessed and it was still a really cool message and I got really cool snippets from it that I want to share with you guys. So tonight the uh, sermon was called Leverage. I thought that was really weird because I would never think of leverage in the sense that I knew it with God. But the word leverage means basically using what you have to accomplish a goal. And he talked all about like monopoly and he used lots of like examples and stuff. I'm not going to use those because I think that it just got too complicated. But pretty much um, the scripture that we were in was Matthew 19, 16, 22. And I guess a lot of times people use that in reference to money. And there's like two sides of that that the scripture kind of gets twisted. And... Um, Sometimes church will t churches will talk about it just to kind of like guilt people into offering or tithing. Um, it's called the prosperity gospel. And it's pretty much like if you have money and are earning money and making money you and are a Christian, you're going to have the happiest life, which is just ridiculous because Christians go through everything else everything else that everyone else does and it's not always like sunshine and rainbows all the time like I remember when I got uh, baptized I kind of had this expectation of like you know new life like this but it was like a new perfect happy life and then when things got rough the for the first time I was like wait what happened to that whole like new life thing and you know, being happy all the time and life being happy, happy and perfect and money and like all that stuff. Like what happened to that? Um, and that was kind of like the first realization that like new life in Christ doesn't necessarily mean you're in heaven and things are perfect. It means that you're living for a different goal. One of the things that he said to me that I thought was really, really cool is, um, the other side of it, which is um, kind of condemning those who have money or save money. And kind of the attitude is if you make money or have money, then you're not doing the right thing. Like you need to be giving it away and you need to be um, focusing on other things. And um, what he was talking about was, because um, there's a lot of retired people here, and it's kind of cool because he preaches toward people that are retired. But for me, not being able to work, I relate to it. So it was kind of cool. And he was talking about, like, when you retire from work, it's instead of thinking it as, okay, I don't work, it's more you're working for a different boss. And the boss is God. And um, But God commands us to work. And I think that was one of the hardest things I had to come to term with, with being ill, is because I felt an enormous pressure on myself, my identity, to work. And because that's all I ever wanted to do. Like, I never was one of those girls that was like, I want to get married and have kids. And I was like, I want to work with kids and I want to help and I want to serve others and that's just what I want to do with my life. I don't care if I live in a studio apartment and never get married and never have kids. So when that like one thing that was taken away, my whole life just kind of was like, well, who am I? I have no worth. And um, I mean, this kind of, this, this whole series is, goes in with the last series of having worth because you're not necessarily working behind a desk or you know, in a group home, you know, for, for me, um, but you are working for the glory of God. And what we're doing is 
like what we're trying to do and people you know because people are like well, what is that and all it really is is because human beings try to make things so complicated and all it really is is that God wants us to be with God and so work doesn't mean necessarily typing which is I mean if it's great if you have a job and you're working and you're providing for your family and you know sharing that or not sharing it or you know whatever but work in the sense of religion or this relationship we have with God is you know taking the time to spend time with God um, to worship meaning going to church to have fellowship with others um, and to talk to people about it it you know doesn't have to be a weird conversation where you're like hey do you know Jesus because if you don't I can tell you about him it's more like this is what God is doing in my life or hey you know I went to a sermon and this was this really cool thing that I thought about for retirees you know like you're working for a different boss like I thought that's such a cool thing you know it doesn't have to be this like really awkward conversations because well I believe that's just not how you should do it like as an evil when I go to a like it's a non-denominational church but we definitely believe in evangelizing which is like a dirty word for me like it's like worse than the f word to me like I don't like people telling me what to believe and like who to believe in and that's why I'm always telling you guys like whatever you believe you'll still get something from this message because that's how I speak because I'm not like you need to believe this you need to go to church you need to do this um but when I went through a series uh Rick Warren I think he did it it was talking about how we need to build relationships with people and understand them before we can start talking about our own beliefs especially something as personal as a relationship with God so anyways, I got off on that tangent, which I'm sure someone needed to hear, so I'm not going to apologize for it. But um, one of the coolest things he said, and I'm sure it's a quote from somewhere, but I don't know, but it really stuck with me. And, um, you know, I'm not going to read it off this paper, but pretty much what he was saying is if you take a coal ember from the fire and you take it away from the fire, surely it's going to just go out and the same has to do with Christians you know because there are two billion people on this earth that claim to be Christian so but that's not the case um, they may claim to be Christian but if they were we would have heaven on earth um, he was talking about Okay, I'm going to tell you guys something just personal. I don't know if you guys will be interested in this, but I had a moment that, like, I think are the coolest moments ever in church. Like, because the whole time I pray, like, Lord, just because I, like, have a hard time in church. Like, I think about a lot of different things. And, like, I'm like, oh, what am I going to do for churchy talk? And, like, da, da, da. Like, I just pray that, like, Lord, just silence my mind and let me just hear your message. And, um, you know how people are like, Lord send me a sign I never have to ask for a sign like God is always like here you go Emily because I think because I'm so stubborn that I don't want to see it that he just like smacks it in my face but I'm not even kidding this pastor who I don't even remember what his name was but anyways he was wonderful he was great but I just don't remember his name but he said <sighs> he started talking about wealth and um, things that he, he, I guess Bill Gates calls it stupid poverty. And at first it offended me because I was just thinking, he was saying like that people that are impoverished are dumb. But it's stupid poverty because if we took the amount of money that we spent in a year on just romance novels which is in the billions it was like 10 billion dollars in romance novels in one year we could have clean drinking water for the entire world so that just kind of was like whoa whoa like for real like in one year if we just like took that money and put it to like individuals there could be clean drinking water like that's insane 
and he went on to give other examples of things like that because and that's why Bill Gates calls it stupid poverty because we can do such little things to make such a huge impact. My antennas start going because, oh my gosh, this was so freaking weird. Okay, so I just watched a show that's, that is on Netflix. You can watch it. It's so good. Um, it, I, this might not be the exact name, but I'll put it in the description box so that you can watch it. It was so good. Oh my gosh, so good. So, um, cause he was talking about stunted growth and how their people don't have the food, really the nutrition that they actually, their growth is stunted and they're very like small people. I always kind of wondered that. And, um, so anyways, I watched this movie documentary and it's called a dollar a day. And he literally starts talking about how many people are living on less than a dollar a day. And I was just like, whoa, whoa, what? And then in the next sentence, I don't even really remember what he said because I was like, holy crap. Because after that, I had watched this show on Ebola because I share my Netflix with some other friends and they started watching something on Ebola. I don't think they ever finished it. I don't actually even know who was watching it, but I love documentaries like that. So I watched it. So within like a couple hours, I watched those two shows and in two sentences, he brought both of those things up. And I was just like, I turned to my mom and I was like, I literally just watched two documentaries on that. Like that is insane. And such random different things, you know what I mean? It wasn't like I was like, you know, I watched clean drinking water and then a dollar a day. Like it was like Ebola and a dollar a day. But, um, so anyways, that was just kind of like a weird, crazy moment that I had at church. And I think if you're like tuned in and really praying to hear words God and you're at a church that is feeding you and filling you, and blessing you because God is present you will have those moments that are just like what um so anyways back to what they were saying is um if we all lived an extraordinary life um then it would be heaven on earth but you know we are all human and we're gonna make mistakes and we're gonna hold on to money too hard or we're just going to let it just fall through our fingers and um but there are just little things that we can do but one of the main things that I wanted to talk to you guys about was the fact that wait let me find the exact quote I guess I didn't think it was important enough to like x mark the spot or anything um Uh, there's like a ton of awesome things on here. I'm just trying to find this one thing I wanted like really to say to you guys. Any, okay, I can't, can't find it. So I'm just going to talk to you guys about it. Okay, so what he was saying essentially was God doesn't make mistakes. So you were not a mistake. God made you perfectly. So he has a purpose for you. And he doesn't just like, oh, shoot, that Emily girl is like, oops, I messed up on her brain. And now she's going to kind of like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to forget about her. He made me for a certain purpose. And he gave me a set of talents that he wants me to use for his purpose. And so we're all put on this earth to serve this purpose, to bring a piece of heaven to earth. And... It's hard when we don't realize our talents or we're too sad or we're too depressed or too anxious to be able to use those talents or in my case too stubborn um, or a lot of times self-defeating like when we do things just do them like if you want to crochet Go get a yarn, crochet needle, try it. You might fail. It might not be your talent, but at least you tried and you can X that out. Like I can't crochet. I know that now. So I'm going to try something else. I'm going to 
try to greet people when I go out. I'm going to say hello to people and try to start a conversation with them. That might fail terribly and you might move on to something else and then you might find this perfect niche where you are serving God and through that you will be fulfilled and so happy because doesn't it make you feel great when you find something that you're really good at and you get this positive feedback from people that feels awesome right so that's what God has made us for but sometimes there isn't always this red blinking light like oh my gosh I'm gonna be an NFL football player I know that because I'm freaking awesome at football like we don't all have that like the everyday person kind of is like what am I good at? Like sometimes even your job, you're like, I know I'm not good at this, but it's making me money and that's all that matters. But um, sometimes that's it. Like sometimes your job isn't going to be your talent. Like sometimes your job is just going to be something that brings in money for your family and to provide for them. Um, and the other things might be serving on at, at church on Saturday or Sunday or whatever day of the week your church has service or... Um, you know, working at, uh, you know, a methadone clinic or um, working on a suicide hotline or anything like that. It, it doesn't have to necessarily be your work. And that was, I, I guess, it might not be connecting to you, but that's what I connect to because I had such a difficult time not being able to work because that was my entire identity. And, um trying to figure out who you are and what you're here for when that your entire identity in your mind is taken away from you is really devastating and hard and um I still work on it all the time I still have a really hard time that I don't work and anytime someone says like you know just believe that you can do it and you know be expectant of God and say I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna step out in faith first thing that comes in my, to my mind is like, oh, maybe I could work part time doing something and, you know, like step out in faith. And then the reality sets in is like, you can't, <laughs> you need to figure out something else, Emily, that you can do that is serving the Lord. So, um, uh, I have some passages. If you're into that first Timothy five, eight, second, this is like the one chapter I can't say. Thessalonians, this, I don't know. This, uh, 310, Proverbs 21, 25. And that's talking about um, God commanding us to work and um, expecting great results when you have a plan. Um, so this me his message was, and I'm just summing up here, so don't get frightened. But his message was that you need to have a plan. And you need to ex when you have that plan expect for it to go well like don't like make a plan and be like Ooh, this is like I mean it's okay to have fears and like be worried about it and you know like normal little type stuff but like the majority of it should be like this is going to go great and if it doesn't then that that was the path that you were meant to go on and now you have to change your course but always have a plan of what you're going to do and I think when you have a plan and you have a clear idea of what your life is doing or where you're going that can thwart depression and sadness and isolation and loneliness a lot um like prime example right here you know like when I stopped this the series that year-long project this really connected with me because I had a plan like every day I was going to do vlogs for you guys it didn't matter what it was or how stupid they were but that was what I was doing and I was serving the Lord through doing that and when it stopped I went into free fall I was just like, what is my life? What am I doing? I'm just sitting here watching TV shows, being miserable, sleeping, trying to sleep, not being able to sleep, trying to drink water. Like that was my life. And I was just like, I'm not serving the Lord. I'm not serving anyone. I'm not even serving myself. I'm not even helping myself be a happier individual. And that was because I didn't have a plan because 
when it ended, I just was like, I don't know. What am I doing? So I think that it really does help when you are investing your time, talent, or treasures um, into your life and, um, you know, to have a good life and also to have a clear plan and to have leverage using what you have, whether that's money or a talent or um, your time, then investing that and accomplishing a goal. Um, and it sounds really silly and I always did like set small goals and then reach them. And I was like, ah, but it really does feel great when you reach a goal and you, um, set kind of reasonable goals and know that you're going to accomplish them and know that the Lord is going to help you along the way. It's not going to be easy. There's no, never does God say like, Oh yeah, it's going to be so easy and simple. Just do this, be a Christian, do good things for other people, and you're just going to be happy as can be. That's not the truth of things. No matter how happy you think someone is, like you see them at church and you're like, they are a real Christian because they are always happy. They have problems. Trust that. Um, as someone that is codependent and used to pretend that they were perfect, and I would say Oscar-worthy performance, I was miserable. Um, so just trust and believe. And um, I don't know if I talked about the coal. If I didn't talk about the coal, let me know in the comments down below because that was one of the coolest parts. And I think I got off on a tangent, but I might have talked about the coal. Was that a motorcycle or something? Anywho, that's Churchy Talk for today. And, um, leave any thoughts you guys have down below, um, whether you agree, disagree, or have different thoughts. I am like totally open for anything. Um, and I hope you guys are enjoying this series, uh, because I sure am, because I did not want to go to church today. Honest moment, because I was exhausted. I hadn't slept and I really just was not into it but I'm so glad I did and I love that I'm able to talk to you guys afterwards because I miss you guys like crazy um so I hope you guys enjoyed this I hope you're having a pain-free stress-free day and I love you guys and mwah!